<clears throat> so my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a um, faculty member at the uh, Center for Bioethics, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, and I run a research group called Portal or the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics and Law. And uh, it's our pleasure, uh, at myself and, and Leah's pleasure to uh, welcome you today to the Health Policy Bioethics Consortium about a, a topic that's uh, that's very close to uh, our daily work and our hearts, and and I think will be a great uh, a great conversation, uh, making pharmaceuticals accessible and affordable. Um, we uh, the we have a, a couple great uh, discussants and uh, moderator for you today, and um, I, I think it's going to be a really uh, really interesting conversation. You can go to the next slide. So um, we are set up to have some introductory remarks from the moderator and uh, and two expert discussants, uh, and then some uh, roundtable conversations after that. Um, and then after that, we'll be opening up to audience questions. Uh, if you'd like to submit a question, you can do so at any time through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, don't use the chat to submit questions. The chat is only for uh, technical issues or other questions, uh, please put all of your questions in the Q and A, and then um, and then we will get to them uh, towards the end of our uh, our ninety minutes together. Um, if you uh, are mo moved to tweet um, or uh, Mastodon or whatever uh, about this uh, about what we're going to talk about today, uh, you can use the hashtag HMS Bioethics. Um, and if you're interested in all of the um, various programming at the Center for Bioethics, you can go to the um, Bioethics website um, at uh, where you can see it there. Uh, next slide. So um, as always, this uh, this is a, a monthly consortium that we run uh, during the academic year. Um, and our goals are to bring together um, uh, interesting uh, around, or bring together uh, experts around interesting topics to try to understand um, key controversies at the intersection of public health and the healthcare system, and to think about uh, different potential solutions or to um, analyze the question from a couple different perspectives uh, in order to try to stimulate conversation and, and you know, to move, uh, move the conversation in the field uh, further along. Next slide. Uh, the, this is uh, you know, one of a number of different consortia that the Center for Bioethics runs. Um, our uh, final um, Health Policy Bioethics Consortia of the Year um, is coming up in April. Uh, but as you can see, there also are um, opportunities to talk to to, uh, to get involved with ethical discussions related to other areas uh, as well. Um, and again, those can be found in the bioethics calendar. Um, so let me uh, let me turn the floor over to uh, my colleague Leah Rand, who's also a, um, a faculty member at the Center for Bioethics and a member of Portal. Uh, to help introduce our um, our uh, topics for today. Thank you, Erin. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our discussant and moderator this afternoon. So moderating today is Sean Tu, who is a professor of law at West Virginia University, a scholar at Georgetown, Georgetown University's O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, and a good colleague of Erin and mine at uh, Portal. He holds degrees in chemistry and microbiology from the University of Florida, a JD from the University of Chicago, where he was a research assistant for Judge Richard Posner, and he received his doctorate in pharmacology from Cornell University and completed a postdoc fellowship at La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology. He is a member of both the Virginia and DC bars and is also a registered patent attorney. Dr. Tu has extensive pharmaceutical patent prosecution and litigation experience and practiced at Foley and Lardner in Washington, D.C. He's a legal scholar who focuses on patent prosecution and um, works at the intersection between FDA and patent law. He's also the co-author of three textbooks on patent law and has published numerous scientific and legal works. So we're really pleased to have him today uh, steering our discussion our two discussants are um, starting us off will be Marie, Maria Elena Botazzi, who is the Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine, Professor of Pediatrics and Co-Director of Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. She is an internationally rec recognized vaccinologist and global health advocate for neglected tropical diseases. 
With more than two decades of experience applying the product development partnership model, she has built sustainable biotechnology capacity and has successfully transitioned several vaccines from bench up to phase two clinical trials. As a global thought leader, she has received national and international highly regarded awards, has more than 120 scientific papers, and has participated in more than 200 conferences worldwide. She is a fellow of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, the Hedwig Fenn Emeringen Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine, the Leshner Leadership Institute Public Engagement of the American Association for the Advancements of Science, and a senior fellow of the American Leadership Forum. Currently, she is also an emerging leader in health and medicine scholar at the National, of the National Academies of Medicine. Dr. Batazzi was born in Italy and raised in Honduras, where she obtained her bachelor's degree in microbiology and clinical chemistry from the National Autonomous University of Honduras. And she then obtained a doctorate in molecular immunology and experimental pathology from the University of Florida. Following her will be Tahir Amin, who is a founder and executive director of the Initiative for Medicines, Access, and Knowledge, IMAC, a nonprofit organization working to address structural inequities in how medicines are developed and distributed. He has over 25 years of experience in intellectual property law, during which he has practiced with two of the leading IP law firms in the United Kingdom and served as IP counsel for multinational corporations. His work focuses on reshaping intellectual property laws and the related global political economy to better serve public interest by changing the structural power dynamics that allow health and economic, economic inequities to persist. He is a former Harvard Medical School Fellow in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and a TED Fellow. He has served as legal advisor consultant to many international groups, including the European Patent Office and the World Health Organization, and has testified before the US Congress on intellectual property and unsustainable drug prices. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome both of them to be speaking about different ways in which um, we can use patents and intellectual property laws to advance access. Um, and so Sean, over to you to start us off. Yeah, th thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I, I just wanted to say uh, how excited I am to hear uh, from uh, both Maria and Elena and uh, Tahir. Uh, I, I think underlying both of uh, their scholarship and their work is a, a really important uh, policy kind of goal, which is to get medicines to patients in need, um, whether that be tropical diseases or uh, diseases that are underfunded or understudied or getting generic medicines uh, into the hands of patients. These are really life-changing uh, kind of policy uh, changes that uh, both of our discussants are going to talk about today. So uh, I, I really want to say how excited I am to hear from you guys because uh, I want you guys to know that you, you're really making a difference in many people's lives. And a lot of this stuff goes really unappreciated. Uh, so with that, <laughs> I'll uh, let you guys start and I'll, I'll chime in if uh, we have any uh, questions. Wonderful. So I think it's my turn, right, uh, Leah? Um, so thanks so much, Sean. And I look forward to the discussion with the here i'm going to share my screen and the way that i wanted to uh, a little bit set the stage for you is telling you a little bit the story and the model that we use at baylor college of medicine texas children's hospital in an academic health center with a scientific view right you know as a scientist of how the work that we do um, from even the discovery how it can really catalyze these models of not only transferring technologies, using, of course, the vaccine sciences as my example, but really um, with a purpose, as, as we've been you know, saying, how can we actually get it to be accessible and even producible and usable in everywhere around the world? So I'm actually going to start by just very rapidly putting you even back in the context of a couple of uh, decades ago, actually, with the launch of this 21st century, everybody was rallying around the momentum of the Millennium Development Goals that really kind of brought convergence and kind of resurgence of this importance of not, not only, of course, reducing poverty, mortality, increasing education, better health, um, and everything, right, that, you know, that the world is really has challenges to kind of like uh, 
you know, improve. But in the world that I was living in, and of course, you know, the, the people in, in my team and alongside even Dr. Peter Hotes, that's exactly when we kind of first joined forces, was this concept, a couple of concepts, right? You know, the importance of, uh, again, these infectious diseases, how we even brand uh, ourselves in the context of all these infectious diseases that, that are a huge problem around the world. We, of course, work in, in a set sector within these infectious diseases that are really these neglected diseases, the diseases of poverty, as you can see in the slide, a lot of very, um, very interesting looking parasites and vectors afflicting many people, neglected not because of the burden, but certainly neglected because of the, the, the fact that there's not a lot of uh, commercial incentives because many of these are to, to, to try to be tackled in poverty um, uh, regions around the globe. Um, it was very important that at the same time, this concept of trying to build partnerships and that, that if we're gonna really tackle these activities, we needed to work together. And as examples, I just present to you some um, important foundations that were built and created with this model, right? Of doing things in partnership, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or even others, but also, you know, agencies. In our case, like the Gavi Alliance, what has become really important, right? To really not only from the discovery, but even to the delivery, that you need to have mechanisms that can support countries to really become sustainable and make the right decisions, especially when you want to bring these health technologies to the people. Scientifically, I think we also started seeing the movement of how open science is really important, not only to share, but also to be inclusive. And I'll tell you a little bit about this concept of um, uh, you know, decolonization. And even now, even in communication, right? In sharing, you know, using you know, preprint service or even open access, um, uh, I guess, mechanisms. And, and so for us, we wanted to focus on these global morbidity diseases you know, we can go on scientifically on how, you know, how they affect so many people that they're, of course, major cofactors. They clearly um, get worst if you have other social and political, uh, um, I guess, you know, uh, factors like conflict and even climate change. How even though that you can measure these um, burden by the number of years people lose because they live in a state of health disability, they also clearly are a spiral of poverty and clearly have a lot of um, economic productivity losses around the globe. So when we set up our shop, um, which is a very complicated shop, but an interesting shop because it really brings together academia with a health system as a hospital system, um, um, bring it also like, you know, the, the missions of education, research, the clinic, um, the community, but we wanted to really create this hybrid infrastructure by doing cross-cutting research, of course, you know, even including some of these emerging infectious diseases. We didn't want to focus on a, just a single disease. We were really interested in, in, in the whole neglected disease arena. We recognize the importance of global partnerships, but we wanted to be very cautious with the type of technologies that we would try to develop or bring this innovation. And that's why we created a little bit of a, you know, a philosophy, if you want to call it, a little framework that we would that we use as our guiding principles, um, stemming in this concept of the, the vaccine sciences, but also some diplomacy that, of course, predicated on this concept of open science, right, on team-based approaches beyond scientific teams, right, even bringing in lawyers and engineers and, you know, ethicists, right, everybody, appropriately, right, diversified to make sure that we knew where the cultural intelligence should focus, right? You know, what would work, what would be important for different regions and, and communities. And this brought this concept of reverse innovation, right? To really incentivize ownership from the countries that they would need to use these technologies and achieve these improved health outcomes in the most safe and cost-effective manner. And therefore, by hence, value engagement, 
with all the stakeholders and try to remove man-made barriers as much as we possibly could. And we're going to talk about this concept of you know, IP and patents. But at the same time, we really needed to come up with ways that could enable this work by bringing you know, potential funding strategies. Um, and of course, you know, predicate on you know, diplomacy. So we've been quite successful, I have to say, for the last 22 years. We've actually brought, like you know, my introduction, very kind, developed you know, discoveries that were brought all the way to the point where we are, for example, in phase two clinical trials for a couple of human hookworm vaccine candidates. We have an intestinal schistosomiasis vaccine in phase two clinical trials. We are actually now almost starting a phase one trial for Chagas disease. All of these programs done with Brazil, with Africa, with Mexico, with Asia, you know, so bringing this concept of partnerships. And believe it or not, you know, almost now 12 years ago, we adopted the coronaviruses, launched, um, you know, a coronavirus program thinking that they're a bit neglected because they come and go based on the emergency needs or when you have them or you don't. Um, we put together the partner up, uh, partnership approach and we therefore leverage some of the uh, this framework that we, we already were working on. And of course, as a scientist, I had to show you one slide of science. So what we do is really come up with the technology, right? And, and th I think this is important. We create the actual engineer, um, what we call the starter kits for people to be able, in this case, create a vaccine candidate or prototype that could then be not only scaled, produced, we, we prepare the processes of production, which are the recipes, if you want to call them, with all the body of regulatory and quality science behind it, which are all the assays. And then our hope was indeed, right, to do this tech transfer, right, to these manufacturers, but do it in a way where we would not just be left outside of the, of the process, right? We wanted to be part of the co-development, support them, uh, and learn, right, learn the transition. And, the, and doing this, keeping in mind the publicly uh, uh, open access um, intent, making it globally accessible, right? And, and here is where I want to just maybe finish with then, what were some of the uh, uh, considerations in this commercial sphere, right? So we knew that our core invention in the case of COVID was a well-known technology. The IP really was only centered into, you know, the modifications of this receptor binding domain antigen. There was really less room for broad patent fence covering because you know they're you know they're related you know of, of related novel technologies. Most likely, there would be very little interest you know to to look for broad IP protection. We were of course facing the the fact that you know that even as a technology, we were competing with an mRNA technology that everybody thought that proteins would be slower even though we had a lot of experience and we all dates showed that eventually wasn't that slow, um, we probably would not have had first mover advantage. You know, the regulatory fast track was uncertain. In fact, we even put in some fielders with the regulators and they were not very um, interested in fast tracking. A um, lot of dogmas, you know, you know, eventually well, even some political, you know, uh, potential policy failures. We had a previous experience with SARS before COVID that you know, we anticipated most likely an office action rejection because of prior art, right? Um, and we also knew that you know, variants were popping up, that we needed to have a rapid evolution. We couldn't really narrow the claims. Um, and as you know, the opportunities were really to provide this to the global South. So what we ended up was really just leveraging the, the key relationships that we had. We wanted to stay in that global access space. We therefore looked for partners that had prior experience, right? Demonstrated track record in these protein-based vaccines with the platform that we were using that already had manufacturing infrastructure. They had the workforce, they had the equipment. They already had the same kind of philosophy of keeping low costs and massive scales of production. Um, we also wanted to make sure we incentivize them, but, but at the same time, 
um, putting very clear milestones and, 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 and what would be success in commercialization. Um, and of course, we needed to make sure also our institutions were on board, right? Because we were not going to be asking for any major monetary, um, uh, I guess, um, returns, right? It was, you know, our, our interest was, can we participate? Can we bring an emergency solution? Can we, of course, um, get the visibility that we needed, but at the same time, bring a product? So we actually did this, and I have to say that we did it all by ourselves. <laughs> uh, we actually uh, were able to work some very important uh, groups within this uh, network of developing country manufacturers, which I think it actually even the name uh, gives them a disadvantage, right? Because they always are perceived as these follow-on manufacturers. They don't, they're never really accounted as first-rate innovators that maybe they they always wait for mature products to kind of filter down from the big multinationals which is, of course is a great model but sometimes you need to, to also balance right how much can they receive from someone else while at the same time make empower them to be um, first-rate innovators we actually this probably was one of the first models where you actually show that they can first-rate innovate receiving a research technology from a lab in a Houston, you know, academic environment that is crude and rough and really bring it all the way to the inception. And we actually ended up with three business models, more or less. The first model was we started working with the, like the big, like the BioEs and the Biopharmas and even in Bangladesh, where they, we knew they had established uh, processes where we started by giving them evaluative MTAs, where we give them our technology, they would try them out, they would try to see if they could scale them. And eventually they saw a value of receiving our reagents, our know-how, our documents, um, and eventually ended up into these you know, very global access licenses. The second scenario was when we started working with groups that had really no infrastructure, but they were really interested in building it. And so we joined forces, not only with academia, with other entities, and we really created um, you know, these partnerships where they could also work with the scenario one people um, to build infrastructure while we teach more academically, how do you go by doing vaccine development? And then to be very honest and very surprisingly, there was also a scenario three, which our papers were published, our recipes were published. And you know, a group, for instance, the Cuban case, they certainly, we know them scientifically, we don't have a lot of opportunities to really work directly with them, but based on the reading of their, our papers, it opened up the option for them to really even base their Abdala vaccine, which is practically the same design as our RBD, you know, with a very similar formulation strategy. And therefore, they basically were able to deploy their vaccine strategy. So big impact, right? BioE, Biopharma, you know, has now more than 100 million vaccinations. I think one side note that we did with Biopharma being a Muslim majority country, all our work and our um, focus on ensuring regulatory enablement also led them to be able to certify their vaccine as a halal certified, which I think, as you can see, the cultural importance of how technologies are developed is, um, is important to do. But I want to finish then with, okay, how is this going to now hopefully help us for the future? And we are hoping that you know our hookworm vaccine and schisto vaccine and Chagas vaccine eventually get to the point that we really can build the, the, the second value of death, right? Like bringing them after the phase two clinical trials. And I think some levers and enablers really have to, again, focus on how can we really incentivize more of this first rate innovation within LMICs and within the manufacturers and even the trialists, the clinical trialists, the regulators? How can we make um, more workforce capacity, uh, people, knowledge, materials? How can we reach some sort of also standardization of you know, not only reagents, but you know, models? Quality, 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 right? It's super important along with regulatory. 
But how can we really sustain these partnerships by providing some cost structures or some in innovative way of incentivizing, right? So I hope that maybe now Tahir can give us a perspective of how um, IMAC has, has looked at this and how can we certainly uh, move forward with um, potential even more legal framework and ethics framework to, to enable these kinds of models. I'm going to stop share and send it back to either, Tahir, I think, Tahir, right? Yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, thanks for all your amazing work and for all the work that you did during COVID and continue to do that. Um, interestingly, I was on a uh, Human Rights Watch uh, conversation this morning on Twitter, and uh, it's kind of uh, this week is marks the third year since the pandemic started. And I think the conversation around intellectual property rights has uh, never been so heightened, at least in my uh, 20, 25 years of working in this field. And uh, it's, it's, it's from there that I'm going to perhaps give some background to some of the uh, access to medicines issues that uh, I've experienced through my work, but I'm sure others are familiar with it. Uh, when I actually arrived in India in 2000 and or just before India uh, actually had to become fully compliant with the World Trade Organization TRIPS Agreement, which is a trade related aspects of intellectual property that governs uh, what we might call the political economy of a, a sort of intellectual property. Uh, this is a, a, an agreement that sets minimum standards that all member states, of which there's some 164, have to comply with the basic standards of like protection of patents, copyright, trademarks all these various uh, different forms what come under the umbrella of intellectual property. And arriving in India at that time, India uh, basically didn't actually have patents on uh, what we call pharmaceutical products. They, they used to give patents for the process to make something, uh, but they never gave patents on the uh, actual end product. And this was something that came about in the 1970s, actually. Uh, uh, the, there was an investigation in India back in 1950, started about 1958, and they realized they had some of the highest prices uh, of pharmaceuticals in the world. And, and they had this old colonial relic of British patent law still on their books. And in 1970, they decided to not grant their patents on pharmaceuticals, but also food products. And that was really the birth of uh, the, um, the, what is probably one of the biggest generic uh, uh, industries in the world. And when you think about uh, what came after that with the HIV epidemic in the late 90s, 2000s, that really uh, kind of was the birth of what we call, at least in the, in the civil society world, the birth of the access to medicines movement. And, and, and that all came about in 2000 when uh, some 40 pharmaceutical companies actually gathered to sue Nelson Mandela's government for trying to actually um, uh, issue what we call the compulsory licenses, where you override the patents, a government can override a patent in order to allow the uh, bringing generic versions so that the cost can be much more, uh, um, uh, they lower the cost and makes the drug more accessible. And this was for, I think it was an antibiotic drug, but they had a view to doing it for HIV medicines as well. And they got sued by some 40 pharmaceutical companies. Inevitably, it was a PR disaster for the companies. And I think they've always uh, sort of licked their wounds from that. But that was really the sort of the, the cradle of what the, this work that we see today, that is when we come back to the present of how we try to get vaccines to uh, the global south. Uh, it started back really then. And, and the intellectual property system was you know, it wasn't, not many people knew about it at the time. As a, as a lawyer working in private practice, you know, I knew about the TRIPS agreement and for as in the private practice for us, it was actually great. You know, we, could have, we had this, have this body of law that could harmonize everything around the world for our corporate clients and it would make it a lot easier to get all our IP rights. But then when I moved to India, I realized that actually this was stifling the, the development and technological development of countries that were emerging from, many that emerged from empire. And uh, in, in fact, it was actually in the 70s that as these countries were emerging from empire, they saw the lopsidedness of the political economy of technology and how they were going to enter the new economy. They, there was this effort to kind of create the new international economic order, uh, which was supposed to be kind of almost like a reparation for the years of plunder and empire. 
and then basically to kind of re reorder the uh, the uh, the political economy so that they could actually have access to science and technology developments that they hadn't had been able to as they were under colonial rule. That never happened. Uh, the um, uh, unfortunately the, the U.S. trade policy was was basically saying we need to focus on uh, the global north and then then basically sort of drip feed any kind of. Uh, um, sort of uh, developments to the global south, which never really happened. There wasn't any tra technology transfer. It was kind of a form of technological colonialism. And then what that then gave way to the uh, the beginnings of the TRIPS agreement, which incidentally, uh, the Pfizer, Pfizer actually had a role in playing, in pushing in the 1980s. And when I arrived in India, one of the things, the biggest concerns was, was what, what we're going to do now that the patent laws are on the books. So we did build in some safeguards. India actually became one of the sort of beacons of how do you actually develop a patent law so that you can prevent some of what we call this excess patenting that goes on by pharmaceutical companies. And a lot of our work as an organization in the focusing on the drug pricing crisis in the United States really looks at this is how pharmaceutical companies are using the patent system, not just really to invent something new, but to actually prolong their monopolies and prevent competition from coming in much earlier. And we successfully challenged uh, the first line and second line HIV drugs with a lot of our colleagues and other groups in India in order to make sure that generic Indian companies could still um, uh, export to uh, Africa. I think at that time, and it may be still the case today, uh, India supplies some 80% of HIV and uh, drugs to, to Africa. But that was uh, sort of between 2000 and 2008. So there were a lot of successes. We were pushing back against a sort of international regime of intellectual property, which has become globalized and uh, all under the, the, the guise of that this was good for their international, good for the global South's international economic development. And soon after the HIV uh, uh, epidemic, we had also this other silent uh, epidemic, which was hepatitis C. And there were some new antiviral drugs that were coming out or the oral pills. The previous treatments were a, a lot more toxic. It was a uh, pegylated interferon. And again, we challenged, we were the first organization along uh, to challenge the, the patents even before these, uh, these were approved. And it helped to at least get some licensing deals and get the pharmaceutical companies to the table in order to improve access. But these were all sort of drug by drug uh, scenarios. And, and, and just actually, just last week, uh, we, uh, with a, a bunch of other organizations, have uh, uh, written a letter to the USTR um, uh, for the drug Trikafta, which is a, 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 a drug which is treats uh, cystic fibrosis, in, in, cystic fibrosis in, in children. And we've said to the, the, the USTR not to uh, uh, sort of put pressure on a number of countries like India, South Africa, Brazil, if they were to issue compulsory licenses for this drug, because people have been not been able to access it. It's far too costly. And because um, what typically happens is when countries try to use what we call these flexibilities, in the TRIPS agreement, i.e. a compulsory license or that you can challenge a pattern, the United States and the European governments come down on them uh, heavily and they put a lot of trade sanctions and pressure on them. Uh, and this is this is a fundamental problem is why why many countries in the global south have huge problems trying to access medicines. Um, and I think ultimately, when we look, when we come back to the present and we look, think about what's happened with COVID, uh, Many people said, oh, well, you know, these global South countries, they can't develop these technologies. I think um, <clears throat> uh, Mary, Maria has already shown that there's, there, are, there is capability there. Uh, it just needs, there needs to be a better collaborative model to kind of uh, uh, bring a lot of these technologies to the fore. But the other thing is, is, is also, you know, a lot of people have spoken about the mRNA technologies and what have you. Interestingly, uh, there's a lot of litigation going on at the moment between uh, Moderna and Pfizer and Aaron and Aaron and I wrote a piece actually in the inquiry about this uh, where we mentioned that um, uh, whereas Moderna and Pfizer were out there blocking uh, the uh, uh, a waiver of intellectual property at the World Trade Organization which uh, was actually proposed by India and South Africa in order to help uh, more access to technologies in order to so that these countries could develop their own capabilities. Um, Pfizer and, and Moderna saying no it wasn't needed and and yet, uh, when you see the litigations that they're involved in now, they had, in essence, give themselves a waiver to kind of impinge potentially on other people's IP, which was the nanolipid particle technologies that uh, various companies had actually had. had. And, and so 
it begs the question of it's like it's one rule for one and another rule for for others and it's usually the global south that suffers from this and what's more interesting is um public citizen uh, had access to some of the agreements that, for example, Pfizer had made with some country governments in the Global South, and one particular one was with Colombia. And in that agreement, they had asked the Colombian government to indemnify them against any patent infringement or IP infringement. And as soon as I saw that clause, and this was before all this, uh, uh, these cases broke out about all the various infringement actions that they were all taking against each other, it kind of like reminds me of an image from Reservoir Dogs saying, I, you know, I own the technology, I own the technology. And uh, and that indemnification clause, the first thing I saw that was like, somebody's infringing somebody. Because that basically allowed Pfizer and, and, and Moderna, in my mind, to get ahead. And yet, at the same time, they were holding the rest of the world back. And these companies have made billions of dollars, largely through public funding uh, in, 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 in many ways. That's not to say that they didn't add value. But I think this is where I feel, and, and this is a controversial uh, point I often make and, and people, many people might disagree with me, but I think this is where I think we confuse invention with innovation. Innovation in my mind is, is the commercialization of the knowledge and technology that exists. And we knew a lot of uh, the mRNA stuff existed. I mean, even Moderna just recently has agreed to pay royalties to the NIH for the upstream technology development that had happened in mRNA. And what we do is, and we hand patents out on innovation which is actually more the commercialization, which I'm not saying is not important, but I think that's not the social contract that I understand the patent system to be, which then begs the question of really, is the patent system about invention or is it about investment? Now, I remember a great, great quote by a UK judge, Sir Hugh Laddie, who unfortunately has passed away. And, you know, he, he, he in my mind, was one of the probably the, the, the best uh, supporters of the patent system. And he wrote this seminal piece said, what's invention got to do with it? Because he said, most things are obvious when we think about it from a patenting standard. Forget about everything else. From a patenting standard, most things are obvious. But he said, but we need the investment. So that's why the patent system works. Which begs the game question, I take that point a bit further. Is the patent system really an artificial construct of managing knowledge, when really it's about driving investment? And if it's about driving investment, why don't we have an investment for reward system rather than pretending, you know, all this stuff that I invented this and I hold the knowledge on this? Because what we have is a winner, set, winner takes all approach, which holds a lot more back than actually making it accessible. Because I think ultimately science, and I think Maria may agree here, is a collaborative process. People are building knowledge on top of knowledge. No one, the, the idea that there's a, a single person in a lab with a white coat inventing something is a myth. And I think it's a myth that's been perpetuated in American culture and society far too much. And I think it's been, it's kind of, we need to break out of that. There's so much collaboration. I think the open science aspect that Maria talked about, I think that's the way to go, particularly if we're gonna actually tackle some of the greatest pandemics that we probably haven't even faced yet. And when we think about climate change, change and the technology and mitigating technologies there, are we gonna basically just be doing that on a charitable basis like we did in COVID? I don't think that's going to help any of us. And so I think the, the patent system, yes, it served its purpose up to a certain point. But I think the way the companies now manipulate it, and we see this in the drug pricing crisis that the US faces, and our studies have shown that it's, the system has become so financialized in the sense of it's all about giving, uh, sort of making uh, shareholders happy and, and actually making sure that the life cycle of one product that's a blockbuster continues. I'm not going to really invest in, in real new technologies and new developments of drugs and medicines that we really need. I'm just going to make sure that I kind of just do these more incremental tweaks, call it innovation, call it incremental innovation, because everybody loves innovation without questioning it. And then basically uh, keep the shareholders happy. But meanwhile, you're sitting on piles and piles of knowledge that nobody else can really access. And you're fencing off huge swaths of research. And if you just have to look at the upstream patterns that these companies follow, they're literally scorching the earth around anybody from coming in to do any work around it. And all that is sitting idle. So this is where I think the open science aspect is, it needs, to, needs to happen. I mean, one, one suggestion I've made in the past is, is that if you don't use it, you lose it. And that means basically after three years, if the patent is not being put into some kind of clinical uh, effect uh, or trial or something, 
then basically the pattern falls away. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of knowledge that's sitting idle because companies decide what they want to do from a purpose of profit. Thank you. All right. Really interesting uh, talks. I, we have a question from uh, the audience. Uh, it, it says, what can the WHO do to ensure accessibility to these patented high-priced essential medicines? Uh, thinking about benefit slash high-priced patented medicines are increasingly listed on the essential medicines list, yet access issues continue. Uh, is there a bigger role for advocacy there? I don't know, Maria, if you want to go first. Well, I can give you again the, the, the more scientific answer, right? Um, which which is has been our experience working with these producers uh, in India and Indonesia, which they've actually already even had precedent of understanding how they interact with the World Health Organization to seek that quality stamp of the pre-qualification, right? And what does a WHO pre-qualification give you? What do they give you is one, it's it's um, a, a parallel um, uh, review of, of all the quality system from even um, auditing your factories, making sure you have a, a quality, you know, evaluating, of course, you know, the dossiers, the technical, the scientific, the, the regulatory, et cetera. And then once, for example, a product receives WHOPQ, it, it, did, it doesn't matter if he has not gone through a FDA, EMA, or one of these stringent regulatory bodies, then smaller countries rely on that WHOPQ to then say, okay, we don't have to worry about reviewing all these dossiers and doing all these audits and, and, and things in, in, in India or Indonesia, we can then receive the products, um, import those products, um, register them or, or, or approve them for use because it, they've gone through this, um, this process. And in the context of COVID, which you know, we then assume that they've already have experience with these developing country producers, even though these pre-qualifications are product specific, that they would be accelerated at some level. And that did not happen. Clearly it did not happen. If you look at who got received any PQ level uh, approvals, they're pretty much the same multinationals that in fact have also received big stringent regulatory approvals. And so really not none of the smaller or even global South producers were able to be accelerated in their review. And so there's clearly also a little bit of inflexibility in, in the policies and even in, in um, prioritizing where to put you know, their efforts in. And, you know, and we know that you know, everybody was pretty uh, stressed and overworked, right? Nobody had enough people or even money or time to, you know, to attend to this. But clearly, there was also a disconnect, and so this is also another example, right? Of who do they should they focus on in playing a role as a World Health Organization? I think probably that it would be ideal if it can be revisited and and um, and make it better, right? And make it more, you know, less talk of equity and more real action of equity. So I'm gonna stop there. All right, great. Uh, so I, I I have a question or a comment and then a question uh, for you, Maria. Um, it, 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 I think that my comment is people really don't focus on commercialization strategy when they think about IP. And I don't think people recognize that it's a really big lift to move from the science to getting a product out there. Uh, you know, not only the manufacturing and creating all of this infrastructure needed to uh, create the drug, but also going through that really expensive regulatory uh, approval. Uh, it's interesting that you are doing this with no patent protection. I remember seeing one of those slides. Uh, and I'm wondering why you decided to do it that way uh, versus patenting it yourself and then giving it away, like uh, similar to what Jonas Salk did uh, with polio. My fear is, uh, uh, as Tahir had mentioned, 
a lot of people are trying to get incremental innovation and uh, patent protecting uh, that. And uh, my fear is that if you give away the core technology, then wouldn't you have other companies uh, who would try to patent these follow on innovations and kind of take that away from uh, the creative commons? Well, you know, it was it was also very um, specific as it relates to COVID, right? And the fact, like, as I think I mentioned that we 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 did try to um, to process a, a provisional and, and 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 we even had a provisional when we were doing the original engineering because our core technology, like you said, right? Maybe the recombinant protein technology is pretty generic for the most part, but our our real tinkering with the genetic code and how do you really frame it in the context of the, the platform, some innovation in the formulation science, right? You know, for mode of use or you know, or as an immunological inducer, right? But we knew when we were actually, you know, working on the SARS that that there was a lot of push pushback because all of this was really prior art, right? So at, so at some level, it also, as I think Tahir mentioned, is you know what what was the purpose of the patenting really going to be for, right? Even as you said, you know what's the purpose of patenting if eventually we're going to give it for for free or relatively free, right? Or open access. And then I have to also tell you that that the cost of maintaining these um, provisionals and these you know submission of the patents and then. We wanted to also have the international uh, um, applications. That adds up, and 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 we we were struggling on getting even our grant money, to, you know, and nobody really pays for that. And mm -hmm. then maybe to answer your your the, the whole argument of, you know, the amount of yes, uh, value of death transversion of you know from not only going from basic to clinic, but then clinic to really deployment. You know, we saw that we needed to play a bigger role in this regulatory enabling um, work because where a lot of the companies or the private sector or the multinational sector sees uh, uh, that they have an issue is in the risk, right? Risk of failure. And in the fact that when they work with academia, they get they always think that they get such not regulatory and not so high quality records and data that they actually have to redo everything from scratch, right? And so we, for decades now, we have recognized that we don't, we want to be, you know, partners and therefore they don't, ha they have to stop perceiving us that we do some great science, but that we don't take it into the regulatory pathway. And so investing into changing our own culture of everything we do has to have a regulatory enablement, right? Even from how we write the experiments, the standard procedures and, and having our institutions buy into that because that also requires their investment has been amazing, right? Because now more, we think that's actually an incentive, right? BioE, why do BioE came to us? Because they knew we had high quality data that they didn't actually have to redo again, right? And I think that also helped and therefore avoided having to do all these more legal uh, patents or even IP protection. Excellent. Uh, I have a question also for uh, Tahir. Um, I really like your kind of uh, separate dichotomy between patents as an investment or patents as actual innovation. And uh, I, I'd like to push you a little bit and question you as to like, what can you imagine a system where we instead of having this pro or having this kind of winner take all system uh, with, with using patents, uh, instead use a prize system. So, uh, for instance, I can imagine a system where we say, okay, you you don't get patents on drugs, but what we will give you is regulatory exclusivity, uh, which you can then recoup your costs and also make a profit that way. And then it becomes much clearer, uh, and you don't play these games. Uh, to kind of determine, well, is this patent really innovative? Is it valid? Is it non-obvious? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a great, great question, Sean. And I think, I think, uh, I think that's that's somewhere where we need to get to. Whether it be a price system or whether it be like you get a fixed period of like here's your exclusive period that you're going to get so that you can recoup your 
your investments or what have you. I think the price system actually, there's some aspects of it that I like, there's some aspects of it that I'm still sort of figuring out and I'm sure we all are in terms of how it would work because at the same time, you know, even with the price system is like, you're all probably still collaborating or taking knowledge on knowledge. So who gets the prize? I mean, I think about, I think about just even like, you know, the Nobel Prize, it's like usually a, a whole bunch of people that contributed to whatever that Nobel laureate gets or whatever. I don't think that's, I don't like prize systems for that purpose. I think the, the people forget forgotten in that process. And that's why I think something more, op, you know, where, where there has to be a, a more of a collaborative nature to the prize, if it is that, that everyone gets recognized for their involvement and role. And then how then do you di divvy up the, the, the sort of spoils? Um, but all the, you know, one of the discussions I know that's going on sort of back channels is, is like, well, let's do away with patents and let's just give companies like say X number of years of, you know, market exclusivity. I think that's possibly one way to go because obviously, you know, companies are going to invest uh, or want to invest and want those the rewards. But I, I, I think it, you're right. It would take us away from this mass, I think, wastage of resources in litigation. And I was just speaking to someone and this is kind of, I'm not going to say who it is, but somebody who just bought a bias uh, is trying to enter or get a biosimilar version of, a, you know, one of the best selling drugs onto the market. They spent $40 million on litigation. 40 million trying to get through a whole bunch of patents. That is such a waste. The patent system is actually one of the most inefficient models now that we have today because of the way it's being worked. I'm not saying that has, that's how it was intended when it started, but that's how it's become. And I think we need to move away from that. We need to have some kind of like, here's your, here's your reward. And whether it's like 15 different people share that reward and can go off and do whatever they like with it, because ultimately that's competition. And then if you make an additional sort of variation of it, that's kind of true, you make the product a little bit more easier to take or whatever, then the market decides your reward. Because like, hey, I've got a slightly different, better product. I'm not going to get another pan or whatever. But, you know, what we're doing is, 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 you know, there's an interesting, I'm just reading the question here is, is it going to, uh, are we going to have unintended consequences? We have unintended consequences now. Millions of people are dying because they don't get access to these benefits because we have certain power brokers that hold all the knowledge and power. And I think when the way I think of it from a sort of logical, rational sense is if we have a system where we are actually too scared to change it because the other side says, well, we're not going to invest, then you know fundamentally there's something wrong with that from the outset. You would not tolerate that in your own household. You would not tolerate that in any other place. But yet we tolerate it on some of the most important decisions and policies that we make today. I find it flabbergasting. So I'll, I'll add on to that, you know, like when Hatch Waxman, and this is stuff that Portal and Aaron has written about uh, pretty extensively, when Hatch Waxman was actually created, it was a system that actually worked pretty well. Uh, you know, you would see uh, people uh, getting on the market, litigating to final judgment, invalidating patents, and going on the market. With that said, uh, I think the industry uh, kind of got wise to this and started playing games, right? And this is, you know, this is not the way it was in the 80s. Like you'd have like maybe two or three key patents on your drugs. Now we see lots and lots of methods of use, uh, formulations, all sorts of game dosage strategies. And all of this is just garbage that makes it more difficult for uh, generics to, it, it increases my transaction costs, right? And at some point in time, if I have to clear a hundred patents versus two, uh, it's it's going to cost me forty million dollars to do that. And what does that mean? That means that only a small number of companies are going to kind of take that risk, right? Because if I lose, then I'm out forty million dollars. Uh, or uh, it it you know it just means that we're going to get less che less drugs out there that are cheaper. And it's not really and you know. I'm of the opinion that I've looked at a lot of these patents. It's, a lot of them are just not that innovative. With that said, so the, the counter argument that you're going to get is that, well, although they're not that innovative, they actually do add value, right? So we do see uh, things like albuterol inhalers that, you know, have the dosage counters. Yeah, it's, it's actually valuable for me to know how much drug I'm taking or an extended release pill that allows me to you know, take one pill instead of two pills. I'm all for that kind of innovation. Um, with that said, I don't think we should be paying a thousand times what the drug costs the manufacturer because you created a, a, a pill that 
is encapsulated by something that dissolves a little bit slower and has the exact same pill in the center uh, that you patented and that patent expired, you know, like 20 years ago. Could I, could I just add to that, Sean? I mean, it's a very yeah. it's an important point because, you know, people say, oh, you know, we need the innovation, what have you, and, and uh, don't, don't you want a sort of subcutaneous uh, version of a thing or, uh, you know, a different a tablet instead of a pill? Or you know, as, 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 as somebody who's, who's been in the patent business for a long time, you know, when I think of it, you, know, you get a patent for showing that it's novel, that it's something that didn't exist before. Um, it's got to be non-obvious, right? So something that's not commonly practiced or well well established in the field. You know, this uh, it's got to have you got to you got to be able to write the description in the pattern such that it actually, um, uh, you know, you actually in grasp of the actual invention. You know, you're not kind of just doing some broad strokes, and and somebody can then work it once it's actually gone off. And then the fourth is actually, which I think often gets forgotten, but is the main argument of a lot of people that why they give patents for these things, the utility. Oh, it gives some benefit to society. So when I think about it, I deconstruct that. We've forgotten about the first three steps and we say, oh, we want, we want the utility aspect of it, but we don't care if it's novel or non inventive or whatever. Mm -hmm. But isn't the patent system of that invention? It, it, and I would I would add uh, enablement, right? So you also have to teach us how to actually make and use uh, this thing. Uh, but, I, which, but I think a lot of economists, they push this, oh, but we like the, you know, it doesn't matter if it's inventive, we want the utility aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Then why do we have the patent system? Right, we could, we could use it uh, uh, prizes too. Um, okay, so I have uh, two questions and I think we've touched on uh, both of these answers, uh, one, uh, or both of these questions kind of tangentially, but I'll ask them kind of uh, just to get them out there. Uh, one question is about unintended consequences. Uh, and it, the question asks, if pharma companies have the most resources to develop and produce drugs, but won't proceed unless there's a potential for a minimum amount of profit, is there a risk that moving the profit incentive may actually reduce innovation or uh, that democratizing innovation may lead to more snake oil uh, that is difficult to distinguish between, from safe and effective medicines, uh, such as uh, ivermectin for COVID? Um, Maybe I can just make a quick note because I think there's all there's always this thought that it's all or none kind of thing, right? There's always going to be some some profit, right? You know, like even like even if you sell your one dollar a dose vaccine, there's always profit because of course then you have more volume and you know so and then of course it depends on how you really also quantify when that profit will come, right? I think people are always used to like I need my profit tomorrow. You know, and sometimes these things are like very long term, right? I mean, especially the vaccine is very much more complex than maybe small molecule drugs or even diagnostics because the realization of the value of your intervention, it's really very long term, right? You're preventing diseases. So you're, you're, you're improving the, the health of a population that from when they're a child and then when they become an adult, right? So I think, and, and I think there's, there's this also this perception that 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 again that the that the farmer or the multinationals are either really the bad guys or really the good guys. But I have to say they play a role in, in multiple ways too, right? You know, like the donation of Praziquanto, the donation of the uh, uh, um, parasite, the, the warming medicines. Those eventually, you know, you know, they're they're basically subsidized by these multinationals, right? Of course, they they cannot always be subsidizing for everything, so of course they have to make their profits. But I think it's a based on the context, right? If it's an emergency situation, there should be a, you know a different model than when you're indeed having a, a not you know emergency situation. You know, the fact that you're um, you know you even have models where you maybe you can do some tier pricing approaches, right? When you have dual use, right? When it's in the private sector, you know, a commercialization versus a country subsidizing a product because it's to be used for, for poor people. You probably know more about this. You know, I'm not a business nor lawyer or anything, but I am sure there's some ways that you can balance the thing, right? I mean, it's not all or none, right? 
all the multinationals are bad, all of us academics are good, right? You know, it's, you know, there's kind of like has to be like middle of the way ground and flexible enough that you can change, right? According to the situations that arise. I, 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 I'll have a kind of an add-on question to that, which is, uh, we, I mean, we've seen solutions come up from COVID, right? Um, here in with the COVID uh, uh, kind of uh, situation, the government actually invested heavily on both winners and losers. They just said, here's like $10 billion. We need a solution today. And what they did was really interesting, which was de-risk that process, that commercialization process by saying, hey, whoever gets there to a, a solution, we will pay you for X amount of doses for X amount of price, right? Can you imagine this kind of situation for other diseases? Is this is this a good kind of governmental solution uh, for underserved populations, uh, other diseases, or maybe even moving it into like the brand kind of company situation? I'd like to hear from both of you on, on that kind of idea. Well, uh, maybe I'll start and that here I would hope you can join in the conversation. I mean, for us, I, I agree. I mean, it was it was ideal, right? You know, to have that. But at the same time, it was hard to understand how the selected beneficiaries were of these big ten billion dollars, and that right. You know, it was it was a little. We didn't get a penny, right? We nor you know maybe even many that probably would have had a solution that was even maybe less shiny new toy, but clearly something that would have really raised the access and the equity, right? You know, a very traditional recombinant protein technology was not supported. In fact, it was probably not supported, not only in the US, but pretty much nowhere in the world until later when they realized that you need something that is more conventional because you have the infrastructure than relying on assuming that people will le would learn how to make RNA vaccines from zero to billions of scales, right? So the decision makers is, is something that I still don't understand. Like how, who do we entrust to make those, those decisions if you have this you know, pocket of money? And then what happens indeed with those who fail, right? Or that, or that, can, or that cannot deliver, and 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 therefore, what are the, you know, the, the the potential negotiation, right? You know, we we're seeing now a little bit the case of Novavax, right? You know, what, what's happening? You know, that you even hear that now they even, you know, potentially are going bankrupt. I mean, how could that happen, right? Why? What? Why couldn't there be things that would even then enable them to be successful, right? You know, after all that they were supported with regardless of whether their vaccine was successful scalability wise, but, you know, but we cannot let them then, you know, just totally go under, right? I mean, there has to be ways, right? And, and how do you bring more the, again, the vision of, you know, the global vision and not just the nationalistic vision. So I think that, you know, so many, many questions of how can we improve in this concept? Yeah. I, mean, I, would just, I would just add, Sean, you, know, you make you make a valid point. It's, it's often a, a, t a phrase that's kind of been used a lot now. It's sort of socialize the risk and privatize the gains. And I think that's what we saw a lot of in, in, in with COVID. Again, not to say that these companies did not play a role. I, I wrote a piece uh, actually in stats sort of just at the beginning of COVID. And I was just looking at some of the data and sort of Global funding for basic research and product development for neglected diseases was about four billion in around 2018. Sixty-four percent of that came from public tax dollars. Nineteen percent came from philanthropic organisations. The private pharmaceutical sector contributed just seventeen percent. Uh, that's six hundred and fifty million dollars, which is a, a drop in the ocean when you consider the top twenty pharmaceutical companies' revenue in 2019 was six hundred and sixty-one billion dollars. That's less than one percent. So this idea that the pharmaceutical companies are the ones that actually deliver the sort of uh, the investment and the funding, and it's a lot of it, so it's public dollars. Now, the thing is, is these companies play a role in, as you said, bringing it, you know, getting it manufactured, scaling up, all these things. You know, even Pfizer got money for, uh, and Moderna got money for scaling up their sort of their manufacturing <laughs> plants. Um, I think the government, so for example, the NIH in this case, or any government that's actually supporting its local industry, what have you, 
is doing a bad job. It's, they're probably the worst business people in the world because when they sign these contracts, they give everything away and they don't get anything back for it. And I think we need to change that kind of culture at the NIH and anywhere else. You know, now Moderna's paying back some measly license now that the, you know, Stefan Bansal is, is kind of multi-billionaire and, uh, and, 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 and all made off uh, of, of, of our, our, our taxpayers' money. I think there has to be a better deal somewhere. No one's denying anyone profit. No one's denying anyone significant amounts of money. But at what point do we say is enough? Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. I want to say something really controversial now. What if the government got into the drug making business? All right. So can you imagine a situation where, I mean, maybe that's the solution in that these pharmaceuticals are really characteristics are the, the, the poster child for public goods, right? So uh, it, it seems to me that, you know, it, it again, my intuition is that NIH researchers, researchers who develop these, uh, these drugs, th they're licensing them out to big pharma. Why? Because they're the only game in town, right? I can imagine a situation where if the government is, and I'm not going to say this again, <laughs> yeah. but if, if the government gets into the drug manufacturing business, my intuition is that a lot of these researchers would say, hey, yeah, let's license to the government and let them produce it, let them get a reasonable profit so that they can invest not only in winners, but invest in losers, right? And we'll get better drugs cheaper. And maybe my royalty rate would be even higher than if I had gone to a, a private company because they're not really beholden to shareholders. Like, but you know, at some level, it is sort of done. Like, uh -huh. for example, who do we transfer our technologies? For example, who made our hookworm vaccine? Who made our schisto vaccine? It was Walter Reed, mm -hmm. the Army of the United States. They have a pilot manufacturing facility. Yes, they're not a commercial, industrial, right? You know, they make pilot products that you can use for phase one, phase two, right? But, but, but the intent is there, right? Who eventually is really in the global health space of bringing these products, you know, to even the populations? You know, the U.S. Army, again, you know, this body of, you know, DOD, you know, all these, you know, agencies, they already play a role. Certainly overseas, if you look, for example, you know, Biopharma is a public-private partnership, which is really a state-owned enterprise, right? So it's, it is really public, right, with kind of business practices. You know, yes, a biological E is private, but I can assure you biological E works hand-in-hand hand with the India government, right, because they have to. You know, Brazil, all their manufacturers are government manufacturers, right? Biomanguinhos and Butantan. I mean, so there are examples there as, you know, and I think you're right, Sean, is that here in the U.S., we always think that it's either or, right? You know, there's less of these public-private relationships. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree, Sean. I think um, I personally would like to see the NIH take some of its upstream research and actually build on the delivering it out, getting that, you know, last mile or whatever you want to call it. Because, you know, it reminds me of, even though the drug itself didn't uh, work out in COVID, you know, remdesivir, which was Gilead's, that was the first sort of antiviral pill that everybody, you know, got excited about during COVID. You know, a lot of that was, was funded by Walter Reed and all that stuff, the basic research, because he was initially started off with Ebola. And during the course of that, because it was it was actually an IV treatment, you had to go into hospital, get it. It wasn't actually an oral pill. And then halfway through, Gilead started thinking about developing an oral pill. Imagine if that if the government had just done that. I mean, say assuming it was, a, it was an effective drug and everything else, it, it just got stuck in Gilead's hands and they decided when it was suited them to do it for the market purposes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fundamental problem with the system we have today is actually the government does need to. And, you know, we talk about for you know, President Biden's ex uh, executive order on competition. We need a different idea of competition. Because what we have in the industry says, and this is what the industry always says, you know, competition is a few branded actors competing with each other. That's not competition. <laughs> and, and I think that the pharmaceutical firms have gotten wise to the ability to charge whatever they want, right? Uh, we've really seen, and, and Ben Rome has done a really uh, interesting study showing that you know, in 2008, the average launch price was about $2,000 per drug. 
which is still pretty high, but now in 2021, it was like 150,000 uh, per, per launch price, which is just, you know, it's not inflation that's causing that kind of increase. <laughs> yeah. We've got inflation, but not that much. <laughs> right. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think everybody agrees that this is probably not sustainable, right? Uh, and uh, the real question is like, how are people going to react? I mean, I think part of the problem may be actually in our insurance reimbursement, right? A lot of patients don't see these price increases. And I'm wondering uh, if, if payers actually pushed back on this, how much change we would get if if, you know, if my, the, I, I take fish oil, right? So I can either buy fish oil from Sam's for $30 a month, or I can get the prescription for $20 uh, for three months, but they're charging my insurance $800, right? But I'm going to always choose the $20 because it's cheaper for me. <laughs> like, wh wh why don't payers kind of push back on, on this kind of crazy behavior? Yeah, I, I wonder if they're, they're part of the problem. Um, you know, that everyone's everyone's it's kind of everyone's dipping their beak, so to speak. Um, and and I think that's that's probably as somebody who's come from you know the UK, and I'm not saying that's perfect by any means, but at least there's a there's a, some kind of regulation of prices. And and uh, you know, I remember first coming to the United States uh, after having you know, if I got some a medication over the NH NHS, you just kind of it was all subsidized, so to speak, because the government had reg negotiated and what have you came here, the, the pharmacist asked me, do you want to pay by insurance or do you just want to pay out of pocket? And I had no idea at the time because I didn't know how the system worked. I said, I'll just pay for it. And it was a court to steroid cream. She said, that's $520. I said, I'll pay on insurance, $20. <laughs> so who's getting that middle? Right. But you're right about payers not seeing it. They don't feel it. I mean, unless you're uninsured, it's, it's not seen. And I think that's the, the cultural shift that needs to change. Yeah, no, I think if if the public were actually to see the actual price, you know, if, if you were to say, hey, I'm going to have to pay one hundred eighty thousand dollars for this drug that I'm taking, I think people Congress would move pretty quickly to get a lot of this stuff done. And I don't understand why employers who actually have all these huge insurance, you know, sort of uh, for their employee, why, what, why, what, I mean, I spoke to some of them and saying, you know, why are you involved in this conversation? And that for me is, is, a, is a bit of, I'm a bit befuddled by that. Is the risk just spread so thin that the price increases are not seen by employers either? Or yeah, that's that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have one more question, which uh, is directed to you to hear. It says, uh, "You briefly mentioned an alternative model of investment." reward system to drive pharmaceutical innovation. Can you explain how this model would function and elaborate on uh, why you would believe this could be viable? Well, I think ultimately, you know, as, as I said about the sort of, you know, the patents thing when you and I discussed briefly about it, sort of, it is, it is about investment. That's what the patent, you know, the patent system as part of the bargaining is, is to drive investment to, so people invest to make up these, you know, in, inventions. And if we're getting to a stage uh, sort of in the patent system and, where we're getting a lot of these kind of really gimmicky type patents to kind of that aren't really inventive or they're just building on knowledge on knowledge and, and it's not really a winner takes all system or it shouldn't be a winner takes all system. Then let's just get to a system like, you know what, you've invested X to bring this something to the market that's you it's got utility, it's gonna benefit society. How much did you how much did you invest in it? Let's open those books. And so if you want to get the reward, you have to show all this stuff. Now, is that going to be viable? Are people going to do that? Well, no, you have to get in, you have to get on board because all of the lies we're just going to continue in this sort of I, I see it as a, like a, a spoiled child. The pharmaceutical industry has become a spoiled child. And if you keep giving it candy, it's going to keep be misbehaving. <laughs> and that's what we've become as a society. We just constantly we're so we, you know, we, we're kind of almost captured by the idea that uh, unless we do it this way, there's no other way out of it. And I think that's that's again a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you know, the, the, the Milton Friedman economics since the 70s that has bestowed upon us an MBAs that basically your job is to get cut as much profit out of the system as possible. That needs to be changed. That's what driving this agenda. 
Right. No, absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I, I remember reading a JAM article just recently uh, saying uh, greed is the driver of our healthcare system. Yeah, I think we, that's probably true. We have lost our humanity and empathy for anything but profit. Mm -hmm. and that is where we should start with the conversation. We're going to take brass tacks. That's where we start. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, Margot Bagley has kind of written a little bit uh, about this idea. And I mean, our corporate structure is designed for shareholder profit, right? In fact, you're not acting as a fiduciary unless you maximize profit for your shareholders, right? So, you know, Moderna or Pfizer or whoever comes out with a COVID vaccine, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart or even to help patients. They're really doing it to generate revenue for their shareholders. So how, how is it that we can kind of change that culture uh, or that kind of idea? Is there a, a corporate structure kind of a solution to this problem? Well, just on that point, you know, not to belabor it, but it's interesting because you see these, these pharmaceutical CEOs or investors or what have you, they'll say, oh, well, if we don't get this, then we're just going to invest elsewhere. That's always an argument that's made. No, you're not. You're making a lot of money in this anyway. You're going to stay in this business. You know, that's BS. <laughs> you're not going to stay in this. You're still making billions. You're okay. You're just right. not making the multi-billions that you want to do uh, that you can get away with in the current system. And, you know, they did that in India as well when we, we won the case against Novartis on the drug leave. Novartis said, we're going to disinvest from India. No, they didn't. They're still there. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I, I, I agree also. I mean, if they're making ha money hand over fist. They're yeah. not... They're not gonna. They're not. But what gonna we've done is we've allowed them to keep doing that in more and more and more and more. In fact, we fueled it. And you know, it's kind of like as Milton Friedman said. You know, like CEOs don't have a social responsibility. They have a responsibility to make as much profit as possible. And that's the culture that we breed. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? From my side, yeah. well, you know, we again, we are. I, remember, I come from the nonprofit, you know, world, you know, where even as academics, we, you know, we, even as scientists as much, and I think there was a question of how can we even um, enable a changing culture in academia, right? Of, you know, how can we rework the tech transfer policies? And, and I have to say the way we've done it uh, as a team, as a group is, you actually need to get to learn who those technology transfer offices or who your leaders are, right? Um, and, and in fact, in our case, we did do what, you know, I think it's Anmol Gupta who put this comment is like, our tech transfer policies for COVID were all non-exclusive. The same, you know, I could work with India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, whoever, all of us non-exclusiveness. Right. So a little bit this concept of patent pooling, if you want to call it, you know, uh, technology pooling, right, where we had a technology, everybody who wanted it, you know, maybe had some personalized needs and requests, like the halal request from Indonesia. But at the same time, the reason why we could do it is because we spoke with our leaders way early, right? You want us to be academics and work on tropical neglected emerging diseases. Our goal is to make sure that they are enable access, empowerment of local production. So that requires you to also buy into the philosophy, right? And the framework. And then we work with them. We, you know, we work with them for 10 years, right? To figure this out, what to see that such that in the moment that we needed it, we could kind of like enable it without having to try to convince the president of the university that we didn't want exclusivity, right? And so it's all pre, you know, discussions, right? Um, and then you adapt based on the situation. So I think it, it can be done. You know, you can put greed a little bit aside, right? But on the other side of the coin, we of course do need money to work, right? You know, I need to pay my salary. You know, the scientists need to pay their salary. We need to buy the reagents. We need to, right? So yes, we need to, of course, you know, bring ways to innovate and bring funders and supporters. Uh, and, you know, it, and it's becoming harder and harder to even do that, right? You know, to who, who supports the, the academic research at this point, besides, you know, grant and federal funds. I mean, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, and I see a question kind of in the, in, the, in the queue about this, but when researchers and scientists are not motivated by patents, but motivated by grants and publications, how can you kind of switch 
that kind of uh, of frame shift. And so uh, Nicole asks, uh, we are in a big moment of open science, and I agree uh, that open science principles of open science uh, offers a lot of potential for access to medicines. But could you talk about some of the challenges in implementing open science and pharmaceuticals? Well, from our side, again, it's a very unique scenario because, again, it's 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 for neglected diseases, right? So, so in fact, by opening the science, we 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 incentivize those who can potentially just try to do it on the on, on their own, right? You know, even locally. I don't have experience with like real gangbuster pharmaceuticals, right? Like, like, you know, like creating the next cancer drug, right? You know, um, um, and, and there, and there may, there is some, you know, clashes there, right? Of ownership of, you know, and how, you know, like, you know, working with private sector that they prevent you even from publishing because, you know, all those kinds of things in, a, in my world, in fact, you know, it, it's the opposite a little bit, right? You know, that in fact, open science has enabled more impact because then others learn from you know our our space right you know like it hasn't been easy for example to do vaccine in yeast uh, platforms because you have some very biochemical quirks but the fact that we resolved it you know and and, and we published the failures and the successes that reduces the investment and resources others have to do because they don't repeat the same mistakes we did, right? You know, they go for the what, what it had worked. So there's a lot of value. I think it's just, um, you know, everybody, you know, eventually they all, of course, they try to kind of protect their own thing. You know, we 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 see it in a different way, to be very honest. So I, I think I asked you this question a few weeks ago, which is, why does it have to be that way? Why is it that uh, it has to be only for tropical diseases or rare diseases or diseases that affect poor populations. Why can't we apply the same model to cancer or, you know, Humira? Uh, my, my intuition is that scientists actually care about getting their products to the public. It's the, it's as Tahira said, it's the, the big drug companies who care about shareholder profits uh, that are kind of driving this uh, price increase. I have no answer for you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, any thoughts on that to hear? Like, I, I think, I, I mean, you know, it is a moment for open science. You know, I was just uh, reading uh, the other day about uh, during COVID, there's a, a lot of uh, the, and I know it's a little bit different, but I'm just going to use it as a platform to where I want to get to. The, uh, a lot of the publishing houses all went open science because they knew the benefit of the sharing of research and data and information and what have you, and, and they lauded it. And I'm wondering, you know, why the, the, the science community and the researchers, because I've, I've actually just speaking with a, a, a group of uh, civil society group, which is a the gentleman at MIT who works in the lab there. And he's, they're trying to create a movement, like a sort of like a labor movement of researchers who actually want to have some say in where their research goes and what it does and what have you. And I think that's, that's kind of a, maybe a, a little more sort of activist-y, but I think it's great because it's, it's Baidol has killed the researchers. You know, it's like you say, it's, it's like, instead of publishing really useful, it's like they're out there getting pads and, and making the university look better. And I think, I think we need to go back to where, or have a system whereby if, if research is getting funding um, from NIH or what have you, and they're working with you, they have a say in where they want that, you, that, that, they have some kind of involvement in where that goes, because otherwise it just goes to the tech transfer centers. And you know, when you think about Durham University and they're spinning off all these little biotech firms and uh, the CEOs are getting rich. I mean, when you think about what uh, hepatitis C drug, Raymond Shinazi, who you know has done a lot of great work in the HIV space, but he made over half a billion dollars selling Pharmacet, which was born out of licenses from Emory University. I mean, it's a cash cow for these scientists as well. We need to change that culture in terms of how researchers at universities will get NIH grants to do really important research, that it's not just a case of getting a patent or it's going to the track transfer uh, centers. It has to go somewhere. And that's why I think we're back to that point you were saying, Sean, of I think government, some kind of government manufacturing, some, they, they can take on that thing. And you know, the thing we haven't talked about is clinical trials, because that's where a lot of the costs lie in kind of drug development, right? Um, 
a lot of even, people that's, are that's even outsourced right there are a lot of companies yeah. that do i mean there's that's a problem that money can solve right you just throw <laughs> throw money at it and right. it, i think if the if the government picks enough winners then you know it'll it'll kind of wash itself out but more and more we're also seeing that academia is filling that role of doing the clinical trials right um, because they they have a better way of also being entrusted by the community so we can actually get more diverse uh, recruitment right because you know they know that it's a study kind of done within the university system right and not necessarily led like you said by this uh, you know more artificial you know kind of CROs that you know then they even in turn then come and contract universities to do their work right so yeah, it's a uh, that that area. I agree with the here. It's very it's even more complex than the manufacturing sometimes, right? You know how you design all these studies and where you do them and who you include, right? And what the data does it really show as far as safety and efficacy? All right. So it, it looks like we have just three more minutes left. So I'll, I'll leave with one last question, which is kind of built on uh, our our previous discussion, which is if researchers are doing the innovation, if researchers are doing the clinical trials and researchers are helping uh, to get these things to market, then why is it that our drugs are so expensive? And why is it that researchers aren't the ones who are benefiting? And uh, the public at the end of the day, why, why is it that we're getting harmed uh, by not having access to these medicines that are really built on the backs of public funding? I mean, my last words is you're right. I mean, and even within the big private manufacturing or even you know these pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're, the the anchor is the researchers, right? Because even if I, for example, I transfer the technology to BioE, and it was not BioE leadership, you know, the CEO, you know, doing the experiments. It was these scientists that really then you know did you know the engineering the the scale up and all the work so there is of course science on both sides i think it's where pretty much tahir mentioned is right is how do you then communicate that science and how do you actually um you know measure that the the investments along the the continue right a lot of it that we, we do is uh delinked because we get grants that we don't have to pay back but sometimes these companies don't get grants to do the work they do behind the scenes they actually um get loans or get you know some sort of investment so they eventually have to pay back and i think so it must be where in the formula you calculate those cost of goods the cost of development the cost of doing the testing and the cost of then you know delivering right you know and all that that is where i think we 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 mark up right you know in and where the markups go end up is where you probably then you know the greed comes into play right <laughs> all right leah leah did you want to all right um well thank you all three of you for a really wonderful conversation and sharing the work that you've been doing. And as Sean said at the beginning, work that is improving people's lives um, and, and really making a difference in the world. So thank you. And to our audience, thank you for joining us today. We'll be back in April on April 14th for our final consortium of the year. And so we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much.